regarding Mothering Day, uh, I was thinking, usually on this occasion, we think about some passages, we think about some women <clears throat> in, in the Bible. Uh, today I was thinking about two particular women, um, grandmother and mother, and the character in, in my mind is, guess, <laughs> Timothy. Yes, because it's only, I think it's only one place where we find in the Bible a grandmother and mother influencing in a certain way uh, uh, a, a young man like Timothy. And uh, the, the reason we know this is because Paul wrote two letters to uh, this uh, young man. How young was he? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know how young was he when Paul um, uh, wrote those letters to him. But we know that he was uh, old enough to uh, be asked and, and um, he was given a task to lead a church, a particular church in, in Ephesus. And we study, and in my series, we, we, we tackle this uh, uh, letter of uh, Paul to uh, Timothy. So today we are in First Timothy chapter 4. And I would like to ask uh, our brothers there in, in the back if they can help us with the uh, text. We will go through the whole chapter, reading it. Uh, and um, whenever I will stop in some verses, just help me to have them on the screen. It's, it's really important to look in the Word when we speak, when we try to, um, um, to follow it. So going back now to those two ladies, what those two ladies, what, what was the specific of those two ladies uh, uh, and what was that their influence upon Timothy? Is anyone here who, uh, who can remember? What was the specific thing those two ladies um, impacted on, uh, was, or they made that impact on, on, on Timothy? Okay. <laughs> I think you need some help. So I can help you. Uh, Second Timothy. You can find that in Second Timothy chapter 1. And it's right at the beginning somewhere. Second Timothy chapter 1. And um, Paul is reminding something. He, he remembers something about, something specific about this Timothy. Sincere faith, exactly. That's sincere faith. And Paul says that sincere faith, that sincere faith, that particular sincere faith was uh, seen in his grandmother, uh, Lois or Eunice? Which one is grand? Lois. Lois and his mother, Eunice. And it's interesting how, how that sincere faith been such a contagious thing in that family that been passed on to uh, next generation, next generation. And mothers um, have a, such an influence on that, uh, such a, a power uh, influence. They can do that. And the most important thing you can pass on to the next generation is faith, but not a general faith. There is a specific. Here is mentioned that sincere faith, but we all know that that sincere faith actually relates with something, or rather with someone. <laughs> it's related with Jesus Christ. It's related with our faith in Christ. And we will find out more about this faith today, because this faith has some particularly, uh, some uh, particularities or some features and we will try to define and see how that faith actually we as church are called to keep that faith to protect that faith or to guard that faith so let us read chapter 4 uh, second Timothy uh, first Timothy sorry chapter 4 and um, while we are preparing to read it just remember um, and think about what is the most, um, let's say, labor? What, what is the most um, thing in your life you put the greatest effort in and you want that labor to stay or the effects or your labor not to be in vain? 
I've seen, um, probably you've seen a few months ago, I think it was a great project being uh, advertised, like a, a new, um, you know, a huge rocket to be launched again. Millions have <laughs> been involved there as time. Um, a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of people been involved there. And when it launched, it failed. And all those money been wasted away. Just imagine, think about your entire life, you are putting in, you are investing in something, you are doing something, and then at the end of your life, when you look back, all your labor, you realize it's in vain. Well, let's bring that labor now in our, on our ground here in church. We all are here with one reason, with one goal. And our faith and whatever we labor in his kingdom, we want that labor not to be in vain. And um, let's discover today, let's see what makes it to stay and um, to invest correctly. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished and on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales rather than you train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in whom? In the living God, who is the savior of all people and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Amen. Well, such a great mandate. The ultimate mandate given to church is to protect and um, to keep the truth. And we finished chapter 3, you remember, uh, speaking about church. And church is described there not as a clever organization in this world, which needs to compete with other organizations and show everybody how wise we are in the Lord. And we do things and we can set examples for any other organization in this, loom, in this world and in, in the way that they can teach or they can uh, look to us and see, well, this is the right way how you can draw people to you. No, church wasn't given that mandate <laughs> to, uh, to uh, excel in all these uh, uh, things, speaking in, from an uh, organizational point of view, not from this human, um, um, uh, you know, qualities, uh, speaking from human uh, point of view. Not about how, how can we be such a great impact in this world, uh, doing so much good and teach others to do good. Moral values, or though that is in Christianity as, as a consequence of something else. But we are not called in this world to be concerned and 
put all our efforts into this kind of activity. So at the end of the day, when Christ will come, he will not judge us by how many meetings we hold, we held, or how many people, to how many people we've been uh, telling uh, the gospel, or to how many people uh, uh, we did good, uh, and so on. I think at the end, the greatest thing and the most important thing which will be, uh, we will be taking an account, uh, we will uh, need to give an account, was, will be the truth. Did we uh, keep that truth we've been in, entrusted with? The church is the pillar of the truth. The church is the pillar of the truth. And we will find immediately why such a great, such a great um, goal and such a great mandate to us. Because sometimes we may think truth, it has to do with teachings. Well, it, it is related with teachings, truth. It's related with um, uh, doctrines. And uh, uh, sometimes we feel, well, I think it's too much <laughs> for us. And we know that all these teachings can make us tired. And all these teachings can be a bit, a bit, um, Whatever is related with teachings and doctrines uh, may cause even troubles in the church. And, and we, we know that slogan, uh, which uh, was for a while um, uh, spread around. Uh, you know, doctrines divide, love unifies. Well, I think, I think that's a wrong slogan. It's a wrong way to say it because doctrines, as we read in these letters and everywhere in the New Testament, are so important for us. Those teachings, the truth is so important. And why is so important? Uh, well, it's important because it goes back right into at the beginning, into the core of the issue, that problem we had right from the beginning. So the history of this world starts with one man, Adam. He was incomplete. God creates Eve. And then in chapter 3, not too far from chapter 1, not too long after that, they, uh, they fell in, into sin. So that's the great fall. They sin. And when we go back... And when we look into that event particularly, we find out that actually Satan operates right from the beginning and throughout the whole history with one powerful tool. And that tool is lie. And he goes against the truth. God told them not to eat from a particular tree in that garden. And when Satan comes to them, he challenges uh, them with one thing. Did really God say that? Did God say that to you, really? Well, and he tried to twist the thing there and, and them to, to buy that lie. And he was right from the beginning with his abilities to distort the truth and to create lies. Actually, it is like, like this. In, in this way, he is presented in, in uh, the Gospel of John, I think. When Jesus says about devil, that uh, he is uh, the father of lies. He, when, he, when he speaks, and when he speaks lies, that's his native language. <laughs> and whenever we speak lies, we actually are under his dominion. And we operate under his influence when we lie. So the truth being attacked right from the beginning. That's why we always need to go back to the truth. Why? Because truth is so important, says Jesus. Truth is the only tool in God's hands to make us free. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Whenever we live in lies, we are enchained. We always are deceived. We will be, at the end, we will be taken to a different path. And we will end up in, uh, God, in, in uh, devil's schemes and um, uh, under God's judgment. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith. And that's interesting. How? How that would happen. Speaking about that faith, 
What kind of faith Eunice and Lois <laughs> was concerned to pass on to Timothy? Or is it only that, you know, faith which we can see through someone's life when, when he trusts in some things and is, is so enthusiastic and it's related with more of these things. Actually, in, in the passage, we discover that this faith is really tied with the word or the set of teachings, the set, those set of truths they, they, they had to know and keep with them. They abandon the faith and following deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That was their problem. Now, in order to think about whatever we do here, whatever we invest in our time in church, and definitely we want to hear at the end of our journey, come, do you remember what Jesus said? Come to me, <laughs> good servant, diligent, <laughs> come to me. And we don't want to hear the opposite. Depart from, from me all those who are uh, evildoers. Or um, why it's so important and how to do that. Well, let's see how things happened in that time, how things are happening in general, actually. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and this shouldn't surprise us because it's written and for at least 2,000 years it's there <laughs> and we know. It shouldn't surprise us that some people will leave and they will, they will look in another place and uh, at the end of the day that you'll see that nothing been genuine in his life or in her life. Why? Because they've been enticed and they followed deceiving spirits. So the, the, the first thing we need to learn is to have discernment. I, I, I try to find few words just to help us to memorize or to, to follow easily. Uh, and all my words start with D. <laughs> uh, discernment. When we are deceived, we need to have and to practice and develop and train our discernment. We need to discern which is the goodwill of the Lord. How do we do that? Well, first we need to know how devil operates. And such teachings, says here, come through hypocritical liars. There are people who are... They, hypocrite means to have two faces. That's, that's the origin of Greek <laughs> word, to have two faces. You know, those actors in, in Greek uh, arena, those who are acting, they usually swap different masks and they put different masks on them. So people who are not genuine and the faith has to do with a genuinity, uh, believing in God and trusting in his words. So hypocritical liars, they would always come with something. They would say, yes, but there is something which you miss there and you have to look into that as well. Something is missing in your life. You need to add this and that. And usually in this way, it happens that people are deceived and taken away. They, says here, they forbid people to marry um, and order them to abstain from certain foods. And there is a particular teaching which was at that time. Um, but it says that these teachings or this deceiving activity was made by spirits and they are named here things taught by demons. Demons. Just, just for out of curiosity, when we hear about demons today, in what context we hear about demons? We hear about demons, and, and I think it's so much, um, we, 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 we hear teachings and, and all sorts of uh, um, um, encouragements about demons, how to cast demons, how to, and how demonology, is that right? I pronounced it correct? Demonology is, is taught and we need to know about it. It's always related with some uh, paranormal things, <laughs> with, with things which are, uh, you know, um, out of this common uh, life. We, and and we, 
we find demons always in some troubles, in some always, sometimes we so exaggerate that we see, we can see, and someone can uh, point in everything with, which goes on in your life. Oh, there must be a demon there at work. And, and you know, if you have a, a leg and it hurts, it might be a demon there. Or it, you have a headache or whatever. And, and poor demon, <laughs> let me say, he, all, we always blame him. And I think that's a, a bit of, if not much of deceiving here. Because not always and everywhere there are demons. But there might be a deceiving thing to take our attention and to, to be less aware of the great danger which comes from the real problem here from teachings. And we are so focused on and so much concerned about all these types and we neglect actually the demons are so much into teachings. Wrong teachings. And there is a point with that. You know why? Because they want to take you the most powerful tool from your hand to be free. And he wants to take your freedom. And he wants to take people's freedom if they are not taught the truth. And we have to be, and to develop that discernment. How do we do that? Well, it's really, uh, it's really important to know the word. And we, we spend so much time talking about this. And we have to do that every time, any time. Because word is not only for reading. Word is not only for just taking the box. I've read the box. I've read the chapter today. I've been encouraged. Go. We go now through the day. And... And uh, when I was a teenager, uh, many times, I think it was kind of influenced because we met uh, like our youth today every Friday. And, and um, we were encouraged to read the Bible. We, to read the Bible because that will lead us to success. And I was a, at one point reading one chapter a day, uh, you know, will keep you the, the devil away or how is that, <laughs> you know, always reading and ticking the box. That was part of my activity, ticking the box. I've read the Bible, I've read the Bible. But here, reading the Bible is not only to tick the box, it's not actually about ticking the box, it's about knowing and trying to understand his word and to practice, to train your discernment. There is a, such a lack of discernment today in church. And I say that not having in mind our church only. <laughs> the whole church. It's a lack of discernment. Um, and we need to, to train that, trying to stick with his word. Now, what is that false teaching? Um, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. And we know this teaching was particularly uh, in those times related with legalism and with Jewish traditions. And many of them, they had to do with their holiness, let's say that type of holiness, which they had to live every day sticking with the law. They had some laws, but those laws pointed always to external things. And some people are bothered when you change some laws or some traditions, some regulations, some rules established in a place. Because they find the rules as something they uh, feel they are secure with their rules. So not having rules, they would say, well, it's, it's like you, you, you are pulled here and there, and we need those rules, especially when it comes about holiness. And they said, to be holy, even it's to be, to step on that hierarchy, you know, to be the most holy, <laughs> you even not allowed to marry, because you need to keep you pure. And they actually went so much into uh, those human rules avoiding or departing from the truth, the 
the false teaching at that time was so much uh, uh, about the body, it was so much about the externalities and left aside the deep meaning of God's word. And now here is the problem that sometimes why people reading the same Bible come up with different understanding of it. Definitely we need the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to understand it. But more than that, to go in depth of it. Not coming with our... And when we read the Bible, when we approach God's truth, we have to leave aside all our tendencies or all our prejudices. We, we have prejudice and we want to come and look into the world. Where is that passage where it tells about this and that? And you try to make somehow a teaching to support your view. And that's very deceitful. That actually goes against the trend, the, the, the God's truth. We need to go in the depth. Um, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister. And a good minister and a good worker is always someone who will be nourished on the truth of the faith, of the good teaching, and we need to follow it. And um, for physical training, says Paul here, is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So much teaching and so much investment into how this body to be entertained, how much this body to be worked in such a way. And of course, there were different rules for those times. And even today, you can find them in many other circles um, about diet and about any other thing related with your life, which it says, well, if you are God's people, you'll excel in this area, in that area, and you'll be healthy, you'll stay healthy, you'll, and you have to work on that. <laughs> yeah. It's all these kind of things which are so much focused on, on the body, uh, physical trainings, and they have some values, Paul says, but there is something we can miss here, godliness, which has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. We always need to, to be very careful when we do our, um, or well, live our faith, that we need to have in mind always not this life only, but the life to come. And the last one, so first, discernment, depth. Don't read it and don't stay on the surface. And the last one, be diligent. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, conduct in love, in faith and purity. Until, come, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Devote yourself. Devote. Um, be diligent. It, it surprises us how many times we, it's like, you know, the first day of the year. We always, how do you call that when you put your resolution, the year, New Year's resolution. And we, we set the great resolution and, and I think we are, like we are compete. <laughs> Whose one is the best one? And sometimes we set so, such high goals and, and after one week, two weeks, maybe one, two months, and we abandon that. It's not like that in, in, in God's uh, in, in faith, in our journey with God. 
we have to be diligent with these matters every time. I um, again, it it has to do so much on how we read and how we see all these things, how we see the Bible, how we see God's word, how we see our journey. For some, this journey, it's like an adventure. <laughs> and they would take it as an adventure. And a lot of adrenaline, a lot of enthusiasm, and here and there. For others, it may be like a romantic walk. <laughs> a lot of uh, feelings in that, a lot of... And, but the, 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 the clearest picture of our journey on this life with God is Ephesians 6 which says there is a battle. And always there is a danger. There is always a danger. Don't stay too comfortable. Don't relax. <laughs> Keep going. Read your Bible. Try to find out what God wants for your life, for my life. And it's written there. It's nothing that we have to receive as a revelation somewhere from uh, nowhere. It's like a revelation from uh, the, 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 the heavens would, you know, just crack and, and something would come, a message. The message is here for us. And we need God's spirit to be enlightened and to see it and to understand it and to be protected and to be guarded and guard that truth. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this time when you speak to us. Sometime Sometimes we, we can find you speaking so clearly to us and we are so touched and other times we are so, um, we, we, we have to search and we are uh, to be diligent in reading and sometimes we feel like nothing special happens in our life. But we continue to trust in you and we need to trust in you, Lord. In those days, those days when we can see things, and also in those days when we can't see things. And we need to trust you, whether it's good or bad in our lives. Help us to fill our life, our minds, our hearts with your word. To stick with your word. And your word to be a lamp for our feet. Wherever we go, whenever we go, to have that light from you in everything, Lord. In any decision. And our mind renewed mind to be able to discern what's your will for me what's your will for us for this place for this church lord enable us to see that and to stay faithful to you and not to be uh, pleased only with superficial things with external things let us go deep and um, put our Trust in you in depth, in you, only with you, Lord, until you'll come. Amen.